Palestinian Islamic Jihad is calling for the Islamic holy month of Ramadan to be filled with, quote, terror and panic. Now, to talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from the Foreign Desk in Los Angeles. Lisa, according to the terrorist group's military wing of Al-Quds Brigades, the first day of the month will be a global day of support for Gaza, filled with terror? Right, filled with terror, operative words there. Uh, Ramadan is supposed to be a time of reflection, repentance, fasting, prayer, and instead, uh, these jihadis who have hijacked the religion of Islam are calling for more bloodshed, more terrorism. Uh, you know, this is this is a great point to emphasize to get the whole world, you would think, right, on board to stand against global jihad, to stand against this, this wave of terrorism, of course, supported by Iran's regime. This is yet another group supported by Iran's regime, along with their other proxies in the region, including uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and, of course, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, etc., so um, it's not a surprise. This is something that they do uh, often every year, whether it's attacking Israel on, on Yom Kippur, the, the uh, Jewish day of fast in, in, in 1973, or now uh, where you see them uh, using their own day of fast as a day to call for more jihad against Israel. An environmental disaster is feared after the terrorist group, Houthis, who you just mentioned, hit a British ship hauling tons of fertilizer off the coast of Yemen. Now, Lisa, fortunately, the 24-person crew were able to escape before the ship went down, but it went down with 22,000 metric tons of fertilizer that was originally headed for Bulgaria. Yeah, this is, um, you know, now you have a lot of environmentalists talking about the consequences of, of this fertilizer being dumped into the sea like that. Um, look, this is an issue, right? We're, look at it from, from so many different points. The fact that, that the deterrence from the West is not working. I mean, how many different allies along with the United States do we have out there trying to send a message to Iran's regime to cut it out? Enough with the Houthi attacks on the ships. This is affecting, obviously, the ships coming through there. It's affecting the economy. It's affecting a lot of products that are being in. I have spoken to friends who are in different various import export businesses that are being affected by this in fact so um you know you talk about the economy you talk about really the, the stability of the region and of course the fact that iran's regime does not find any deterrence or does not find any signal um in what the west is trying to to communicate uh what does this mean will there be more provocations will there be um you know uh, escalations of different sorts and will the united states and the west and the allies be dragged into in fact, a more heated, a more formal war. Right now, these are just provocations. We're playing whack-a-mole, uh, and obviously it's not working. So um, this will be a big question, of course. And here, as we go into an election year, um, it's going to be more and more important to see how this this fares. Will this escalate, as it does often in election years, or will the White House try to separate themselves from this and create a bit more stability and, and peace and tranquility uh, around this issue, which might not be in the White House's hands? Now, the terrorist group, the Houthis, Lisa, say they'll continue to sink more and more British ships. Aren't the United States and UK military able to do more to protect these commercial vessels? You would think so, but that's the, the catch-22 that the West is really um, finding itself in. On the one hand, the West is micromanaging the war in Israel, right? Standing back and saying, hmm, could you do a bit more? Could you scale back? Hmm, don't go into Rafa. Oh, try to get the hostages back. Let's go. Let's have talks. Let's have dialogue. And a lot of it's not working, right? As we see that war is escalating day by day as well. Connected to that war, as much as the media will try to tell you it's not connected to that war, is Iran's regime continuing to pull the puppet strings on these various proxies that are attacking the West. So to your question, can we do more? Well, it looks like the Europeans and the Americans do not want this to escalate, right? At the at the moment, they do not want this to escalate. And it seems like the, the signals or the messages of deterrence that they're trying to deliver to Iran's regime, they're just not working. So what does this mean? Well, they try to replace sanctions, the same sanctions that the Biden administration removed uh, from Iran's regime, trying to replace some of them on targeted assets uh, of the regime, meaning targeted sectors and, of course, individuals connected to Iran's regime. A lot of this is too little too late. Iran's regime has been able to sell oil to China, sell weapons to Russia, find itself new partners, make new uh, revenue streams for itself, and does not seem to care about or has been able to work around the sanctions to bring in that revenue and finds itself in a very comfortable place, as we see by their rogue behavior. Now, Lisa, there's a group in the United States that opposes the way U.S. President Joe Biden has been handling the Israel-Hamas war and are hoping to prevent him from securing a second term in November. 
Tell me the, uh, the game plan moving forward by the abandoned Biden campaign. Right. So these are a lot of either Arab Americans or those who are supporting, um, you know, or anti-Israel, I should say, because I don't know who they're supporting in that war. I hope they're not supporting Hamas. Uh, and if they're if they are cheering on the Palestinian people, which they should, and they should want a better future for the Palestinian people, it seems like we're going about it in very, very weird ways. But um, we do all hope for stability in the region and more security in the region. But a lot of those people that you just mentioned, Hal, don't believe that Joe Biden is the one to bring it. So they are very upset with Joe, but what they perceive as a very pro-Israel Joe Biden foreign policy. And because of it, are launching campaigns, particularly in swing states here in the United States, to have anyone but Joe Biden. And that is the game plan. Now, what's what's tricky about this game plan is that this same group of people are very much opposed to Donald Trump. So if you're opposing Joe Biden, as it seems like a very myopic choice at the moment, you are actually voting for, for Donald Trump. So how will this go? Their, their initial plan is to keep Joe Biden off of the ballot, which will be difficult the way things are going unless he drops out or something else happens. Um, but again, giving them that then those votes to Donald Trump. So we have we will have to see how this pans out. But again, their initial goal at the moment, very urgently, is to keep uh, or at least send the message to President Biden that they're against his foreign policy concerning Israel and they will do whatever it takes to keep him off of the ballot. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is furious with his war cabinet minister, Benny Gantz, who allegedly had plans to travel to Washington recently to talk with senior officials. Why was Netanyahu so upset? You know, um, it, there's always been the rift between uh, the Biden administration and Bibi Netanyahu. To a bigger extent, it was between President Obama and Bibi Netanyahu. Then you add to that the rift in Israel between various politicians, left, right, uh, and, and the Bibi um, uh, uh, government. Um, that has obviously in the initial days and months following uh, October 7th, that we saw more unity inside Israel, and now we're seeing different uh, sectors come up again. Um, look, this is this is really um, just a headline. And the reason I say that is because at the end of the day, we would be naive to think that any other official in Israel would have dealt any differently with October 7th. This is an existential threat. They're dealing with it as a matter of national security, not domestic policy. So regardless of left or right or center, the Israeli official, whoever would be in office, would be supportive of getting into Gaza and rooting out Hamas and getting the hostages back as a two-pronged approach. The United States also very much was in, in support of that. You know, in, in, in recent days, we see a scaling back. And of course, all, all having to do with politics. We saw Kamala Harris talk about a ceasefire and about, um, you know, I Israel not going into Rafah or, or doing X, Y, and Z campaign points. They know that they're losing a lot of Arab American um, uh, voters because of their Israel policy. But again, when we talk about foreign policy, and I have said this many, many times, and I think this is the right time to say it again, when we talk about U.S. foreign policy or any stable nation's foreign policy, it should be consistent across the board with our friends and with our foes. And Israel is an ally of the United States. So regardless of who the American president would be or who the Israeli prime minister would be, I think we would see very similar veins, you know, give or take 10 or 10, 10 or 20 percent because of the, the, the personalities involved and the personal relationships they hear. But I think that the across the board, we would see similar policies in any given scenario. So Netanyahu didn't really give his blessing to Benny Gantz to go meet with the uh, U.S. government officials. So what's with the lack of communication there, the miscommunication? Right. And, and, and that's a great question, Hal, because I think it does show and it should not show um, that daylight between these, these various players uh, on the Israeli field. There should be more of a, a united front, again, both in dealing with the United States, dealing with getting the hostages back, and of course, um, winning this war against Hamas. It also shows you know, the United States is maybe preference in dealing with a, a Ben against rather than a Bibi Netanyahu. And that also should not be. I mean, there should be more of a united effort to deal with Israel as a whole and deal with the United States and the White House as a whole uh, rather than, than splintering. I don't think splintering will help anyone, whether it's on the Israel side or the United States. Um, I think it really we need to have a united front against jihadism against Hamas. And then we can talk about rebuilding the, the, the region and talking about you know peace and stability that is long lasting between the Palestinians and Israelis. But 
Um, it will not start out well if we have, you know, all these divisions within the various groups. We have divisions within the Palestinian people, of course, the PA, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You have Gaza, you have the West Bank. Um, and of course, in Israel, left and right really not united. They weren't before the war. We saw a little bit of unity, and I hope going forward there will be continued unity. You know, it appears as though the European Union will resume funding again for the UN Relief Works Agency as international agencies and media reports are casting doubt on the Israeli government's claim that employees actually participated in the October 7th attacks in southern Israel, which left more than 1,200 people dead. Look, there, there's been evidence for years about UNRWA's dealings. UNRWA, which is the UN agency that takes money from the United Nations just to deliver aid to the Palestinians, that's their that's their their platform. End of story. They were hiding things in schools, and what they're dealing with weapons in schools, um, having to. Uh, they, they, they had indoctrination in textbooks that we had found. We covered this at, at Fox News, I remember, at the Foreign Desk. So for years, we have seen foul play by UNRWA not serving the Palestinian people the way that they are ordered to do. Um, now, with October 7th, of course, this all came to an escalation because they were actually, there's evidence of members of UNRWA, who were, of course, members of Hamas, um, and dealing with or having knowledge of October 7th. Uh, many countries withdrew their aid. Uh, and that's not to say that money should not go to the Palestinian people, that aid should not go to them, but that this money should not go through UNRWA, which is connected to Hamas and connected to terrorists who are actually working within the organization. Now, the European Union says, we don't really believe you, so we're going to continue doing it. They see it as a very myopic thing. If we want to get money to the Palestinians, we've got to give it to these terrorists. Um, that's not the only choice you have. And that is the issue. Um, I actually have an op-ed coming out on this issue on the normalization of political Islam as the only way to deal with certain groups in the Middle East. And because of that, we have ushered in formal terrorism. And Hamas, um, it, you know, leading the Palestinians is one example of that. The Islamic Republic in Iran is another example of that. We do not have to deal with terrorists. Get the aid to the Palestinians, but you cannot go through the terrorists, especially when we have evidence that they're, they're there and that's what they're doing. Lisa, anti-Semitism continues to rear its ugly head. A most recent example took place in Zurich, Switzerland, where a 15-year-old, 15 years of age, was arrested for allegedly stabbing a 50-year-old Jewish man multiple times. Now, the medicine hospital with life-threatening injuries. Yeah, it's it's so, so sad to, to see these stories. I mean, of course, first on the level of, 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 a, of an innocent man being stabbed because of, of his religion. Um, I don't know if you heard, but an Iranian Jewish dentist was shot to death in San Diego um, on Thursday because he's Jewish by, by a Muslim patient. Um, th th there's, there's a lot of stories right now, especially over the weekend. There are four others were hospitalized in, in various different cases. This specific case that you mentioned, Hal, talks to what I just said about the indoctrination. Imagine a boy, a boy who's growing up in Europe, who has all the opportunities of, uh, in the world in front of him, but yet has so much hate in his heart that he can stab an innocent man 50 uh, multiple times because of his religion. Um, now imagine the level of indoctrination, the level of hatred, the level of anti-Semitism that runs so deep within these individuals. I mean, you are robbing that child of his childhood. You are robbing this child of his teenage years, which should be the best years of his life, hanging out with friends and doing the things that teenagers do and not stabbing Jews as a hobby. You know, Lisa, we've spoken many times in the past about security challenges involving China, but a new one has surfaced and this one may be taking place in outer space. Mm hmm. Exactly right. Um, we've covered a lot of these different stories in, in recent months about China really flexing itself in all different places, right, in outer space, in the seas, uh, with in regards to technology and cyber uh, warfare. Look, it's somewhere, these are blind spots for the West, the places where we're not looking. You know, we saw the balloon technology, for example, we've seen drone technology. They, we used to call the Chinese the copycats in terms of technology. They would capture a drone from the United States and copy it and put out a cheaper copy, and that would be their entire uh, tech infrastructure. Now they've not only done that, but they have worked at it and worked at it to the point where they are surpassing us or working harder than us in certain segments. Uh, we see that with the STEM that they're teaching their, their young um, students, the mathematics, all of it, uh, and, and really to the goal of surpassing the West. And uh, this is just one example of that. 
She's our foreign affairs expert and host of The Foreign Desk, Lisa Daftari. Thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles. My pleasure.